John said, how's everything <laughs> going, buddy? He was, he was counting us down at the beginning. He was five, four, and then he got silent. And I, I couldn't figure out why for a second. And then I realized it's just what you do when you're counting down. For you time. haven't. You, it's you, very you, obvious. You you haven't done like a broadcast thing in a while or something? What's, what's up? Well, I, 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 generally they're less formal if I do them. Mm -hmm. So uh, five, four, the countdown. Uh -huh. Like I, my favorite thing in recording podcasts is to start the recording when no one's like listening. Mm -hmm. And then to start it all of a sudden and you have all this conversation before. I'm like, ah, shit. You know, <laughs> uh, I like doing that. Um, but no, this is, I, I, this is a pleasant surprise. You asked me the other day, uh, mm -hmm. if I wanted to come on and I, I figure you meant like zoom. Yeah. I, that, that's yeah. what I kind of was going to do. But, but then I was here yeah. in Austin. So I just was like, I'll just come by later. As you can see, <laughs> he's coming back from a Jeffrey Tucker I, uh, charity event. Um, I, Jeff <laughs> I Jeffrey Tuckered myself. I was doing a, what Bitcoin did, which I don't think the interview is great. I think that it's a little dry. Mm. However, um, I, I think that watching it will be a nice juxtaposition for those who watched the last one where I was shirtless. So today I decided to dress up. Thank you for not being shirtless. <laughs> I thought about what I thought about doing was going pantsless today, like doing this and then. Thank uh, you for not being pantsless. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I'm ready for that in our relationship. I don't know that anybody's so. ready for that. Yeah. Well, I wasn't ready for it. That's why I decided yeah. not to, but yeah, yeah. I, I am, I'm looking at this. I see myself. I'm very handsome. Uh, this I've grown this COVID uh, beard this COVID mm -hmm. mane. Uh, I think I think my wife is growing tired of it, so I'm probably gonna have to shave it. But I've appreciated the chance to Socrates myself, if you know what I mean. You think? Uh, well, I, I was thinking more like I don't know, Suleiman or something. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> like what I need is I need someone to paint me a, a portrait of myself like uh -huh. this. This could be my John Adams kind of, you know. You know, we do have phones. You know, you could just kind of take a picture. It's gotta be. It's gotta be pot oil oil painting exactly. it has to be an oil painting for i'm sure be, there's like a filter for it on instagram for something. it to be indelible you know uh, past uh past time mm. like look hang in the white house or whatever you, you want to hang on the white house wow yeah, didn't know you were running for president <laughs> <laughs> DeSantis well is, donald uh, trump won so there's all bets are off i could this is true uh -huh, this is yeah. true i could be president yeah. What 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 would your platform be if you were running for president? Uh, reinstate onion futures. Okay. Uh, number one. Okay. That'd be important to me. Why 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 onion futures in particular, and not say garlic ones? Well, garlic futures you can trade. You uh, can. Yeah. Okay. Onion and... futures you can't. Uh, onions were made illegal to trade uh, quite some time ago. Oh, I'm getting a call. I'm gonna hang up on this person. Wait. Mm -hmm. Decline. Yeah, first that time seems... I've had like somebody like actually take out their phone in well, the middle. And, I, usually like, what I do is I, I power down as I feel uh -huh. like it's a little bit more respectful, but uh -huh. um, I didn't. So <laughs> <laughs> No respect here. All right. No respect. I get no respect. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, no, this is this is a cool little setup. I've actually, I, I don't come to Austin often, mm. so it's nice. And there's a lot of Bitcoiners out here, mm. uh, which reminds me of Miami, but I think you guys are a little bit more serious. Like mm. you guys are the... This, the Bitcoiners who didn't run scams, whereas yeah. in Miami we get retired Bitcoiners and former scammers. Yeah, what, why is that? What What's up with Miami? Because to me, that's become sort of like Altcoin City, Bitcoin, <laughs> and Austin is Bitcoin City. What's well, going on? What I think, what I think, like with Bitcoin Uncensored, we really strived to make uh, Miami the, the sort of the center for Bitcoin, mm. and I think it worked. Uh, but I think I think we got a lot of the tards. And they came to Miami and they've turned into shitcoiners. And I think a lot of Bitcoiners have turned into Bit or shitcoiners. I've, I've noticed this over the last few years. I've seen like a level of despondency among Bitcoiners. Despondency? Yeah. What do you mean? Uh, they seem to think that Bitcoin either is just sort of a bad thing mm. or and that they participated in the making of a worse world mm. or they think that it's not where it should be. Mm. And they um, they think that... If it were to work, it would be much further along, mm. which is not anything like I think. Yeah, uh, that, that's not a sentiment I've heard at all. So. I've heard this now from multiple Bitcoiners, huh. o older older Bitcoiners, and mm. it's it's a little weird because I I never thought that that would be sort of the the sentiment I'd heard. And I don't maybe maybe everyone listening is not mm -hmm. familiar with this, and maybe I'm maybe I've just literally heard the three people that express the sentiment, but I've heard it a number of times now <laughs> from like multiple people. You have a great large sample size there, small Joseph. Sample size, like three people, yeah, but yeah. like it is, it is older Bitcoiners. Mm -hmm. um, and I can think of like three or four others that probably wouldn't express it like that, but mm -hmm. who I think probably by behavior uh, have a similar sentiment. Mm. 
That's interesting because, uh, like, at least, well, let's go back to Bitcoin Uncensored because yeah. that you you mentioned that. Sure. Like, uh, can you describe for our audience what that show was and what happened? Yeah. So it was a uh, it was a show. It was a Bitcoin show. I, I think really the first true Bitcoin podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a show filled with weekly news about Bitcoin and an exploration of Bitcoin users, mm -hmm. uh, which ended up being a lot of uh, drug addicts. <laughs> <laughs> prostitutes and uh and you know it was and perry and boring, and perry and boring. Yeah. there was a perry and boring podcast there were a lot of very famous moments we uh interviewed fama mm -hmm. the nobel prize winning economist for the first time mm -hmm. uh that was a really interesting get because the entire financial world like the financial times was mad at us <laughs> uh they, they were really surprised that we were able to do that I, I remember i remember talking to a financial journalist like how did you how did you pull that off and i like i brought it up and i was like well i emailed him <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Hey, uh, Professor Fama, uh, would you like to talk about Bitcoin?" And he's like, "Sure." And I showed them the email. Like, that's it. And I was like, "Yeah, do your job." <laughs> like, <laughs> so we we it was it was a I mean it was a podcast like mostly fart jokes and Bitcoin. I think is uh, how I would that's describe a great it. way to describe it. fart jokes and Bitcoin. fart jokes yeah. and Bitcoin. And uh, I think there was a lot of prediction stuff mm. that we did too. And it's interesting. There's a, a contingent of people that are re-listening to old episodes, and a lot of the predictions are pretty pretty bad, and some of them are pretty darn good. What so, were some bad ones versus what were some good ones? Mm, I don't ever remember the bad ones, but let's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was mainly I was I was trying to be humble there. Mm. Uh, I think most of them are just pretty good. Mm. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I have people on the lookout too who are listening. Mm. Uh, so I think let's see. I've, I've people send them to me as as they come out. Like one of the one of you know simple predictions like. At the time, McAfee was really mm -hmm. popular, and everybody was right. And, and I, I think one of the like McAfee predictions was I said something about essentially his story is going to end tragically, and mm. it'll be a it'll be a sad story in Bitcoin, and it, it, it's not going to get better despite what people think of him. So that was you know little like little kind of predictions like that. They're mm -hmm. vague, Nostradamus like. Mm -hmm. um, you can interpret them uh, in certain ways, and you come out with a I am the modern Nostradamus type interpretation, or you could say I was wrong and, mm -hmm. and it didn't get it exactly right. But like, there's a lot of stuff about uh, the the state of scams, mm -hmm. um, where Bitcoin's going, who's gonna use it, what it's gonna look like in the future, mm -hmm. stuff like that, like kind of just predictions about how this is gonna unfold. And I think, I think we did a pretty decent job of predicting that. Uh, well, one of my favorites was, I, I said Uber, mm -hmm. I thought was gonna turn into uh, basically just a grade to become just like taxis. And <laughs> yeah. I think people at the time were, were not happy about that, but I, I think I'm right mm. on that one. I think Uber has become kind of just a taxi service with really crappy drivers who I dislike. Well, getting. if I remember, I read a story about how the New York, ta you can literally order a New York taxi, city taxi with an Uber app. Yeah, it's so. it's just degraded. It's it's just become taxi. So, yeah. <laughs> which, I mean, it's fine. It doesn't matter, but it's 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 to say that the world doesn't change that much. And I think that was kind of what we were thinking in Bitcoin is where is Bitcoin? What we were exploring is where Bitcoin changes the world immensely. Mm. And that was in, in underserved services mm. like prostitution or drug <laughs> dealing. And uh, we were not, we're pretty apathetic. I'm pretty apathetic still mm. about where Bitcoin doesn't change the world fundamentally. Mm. And it's just maybe a small percentage improvement on things. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm always, I'm always very, very, uh, curious about sort of the way it changes, like certain things immensely, because mm -hmm. it, it is a huge benefit for those services, mm -hmm. the underserved, um, which I think is a moving target who is underserved, right? Yeah, indeed. We we're seeing it in places like El Salvador or whatever. Um, there, yeah. there are places where Somalia, yeah. Yeah. Kim Jong-un. <laughs> I don't know about Kim Jong Un. Kim Jong Il. Well, Which one is it now? Is the, it's Kim Jong Un. Uh, un, un no, the, the, yeah. the first one. Kim well, Jong the first. Yeah. Well, there's uh, Kim Il Sung and then Kim Jong Il. Kim Jong Un is the Kim first Jong -un Hispanic is Korean leader of North Korea. Really? He's the, Kim Jong the first. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wouldn't it be Kim Jong Uno or something? I don't know. I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> That's a game. <laughs> okay. Like if you're trying to make that the joke, first, it first, should at least first, come on. The first Brazilian. <laughs> <laughs> 
Latin? I don't. I, I can't even. Uh, but like, there's there's a lot of underserved in like uh, Venezuela, Argentina. Yeah. I mean, like this, this it's really int- Argentina. I think has been the most interesting case, the most interesting Latin American case in in the world. Mm. Um, just because of I, I think probably Merchant Papescu. Mm. When he was there, I think really provided a huge amount of liquidity for the country. Wait, he he moved from Romania to Argentina. I thought he was in Argentina. Okay, I thought that's I didn't where he realize. was. I'm, I'm okay. not positive, but I, I'm pretty sure he was down well, in South can, America. Can you can you explain who Mircha is? Mircha, <laughs> because I think a lot of my audience would. Oh know. yeah, Mircha is Mircha's the best Bitcoin. He might be the most interesting person ever to live. To be honest, <laughs> uh, he ran a little bit of a Bitcoin cult um, that was like. In the way that BCH said that core was evil, that was kind of his whole thing. Like Bitcoin core is not good. They ran their own Bitcoin fork. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what were they called again? I, don't, Bitcoin, I just remember they hung out on IRC at they Bitcoin sure did. assets. Bitcoin yeah. assets. That yeah, was yeah. what they were. Yeah. Bitcoin assets. And uh, and and you'd go in there. They were like he was their master. They were his slave. <laughs> It was a weird dynamic. He would like punish them for getting things wrong. It, it was it, it was weird. But he he had like he took his money and he did all sorts of very interesting things, including I think he bought a I think he bought a castle. I think it was in Argentina. Mm. Uh, this is probably better for like Bitcoin Airlog if I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Bitcoin Airlog, you uh, you correct me. Mm. Um, but I think I think he bought a castle in North Korea where he had like sex slaves. But they were like voluntary, so it wasn't really. Wait, North Korea? What? Sorry, <laughs> Argentina. Uh, Kim, Kim Jong Un. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Argentina, mm. uh, and I think he, he like had like f- sex slaves for hire. Like mm. they were voluntary slaves, so I guess it wasn't really slavery. But he like <laughs> <laughs> he had like he had like a sex emporium that was literally a castle. Huh. And then a few months ago, he died in a he died uh-huh. in a in a surfing accident. Yeah, but that, I actually think he died. I don't think he died. I think he died. Yeah, yeah. I, that 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 was, and you know, I talked to Pete about that because he <clears throat> he he's actually like really interested in the history of Popescu and everything else. But man, like, did you ever meet him or anything? I've never met the guy. I've so just like interacted. I've, with inter- him I've interacted with him. I never met mm-hmm. him. Bell mm-hmm. Bell literally went to. I think he went to his palace, mm. um, and met him and maybe some of the. I don't know if it was. Wait, who who met him? Sorry, uh, John Carvalho. Okay. Okay. So. Um, I, I'm pretty sure he met him. I think I think that he might have been part of Bitcoin Assets. At the very least, he was tangentially mm-hmm. uh, with them, and I think he brought a group of them down. So there's people that like did get to know him in Bitcoin. Mm. My only commerce with him was when I made the meme. I'm I just heard about Bitcoin and I'm here to fix it. Mm-hmm. And he put on his blog trilemma, like who who did this? Who did this? It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> so I, w- I went in there. I was like, thanks. And I didn't know who, he- I mean, I'd uh, heard of Merch, uh, but I didn't really think of him. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't really like, know what he was. Mm. And he he invites me into the Bitcoin Assets room, and they're talking to me about how much they like the meme. And I went in there, and it ended up being like basically a room of people I didn't agree about any politics with them <laughs> the only thing we agreed on was that I, they liked my my meme uh-huh. and uh, everything else was kind of like i don't belong here so <laughs> I, I like left um but merch is extremely important in the history of bitcoin like we have this uh, bitcoin pizza day stuff mm-hmm. great i i'm really very ambivalent about the day that bitcoin received a price i think that's mm-hmm. stupid because it would have happened mm-hmm. regardless we all mm-hmm. agree the reason bitcoin pizza is important is because it was the first guy that like was willing you know uh Laszlo was like the first guy that was willing to part with some Bitcoin to establish a price. Yay. Mm-hmm. Could, it would have happened that month or another month or a mm-hmm. year or later. Merch, on the other hand, was like a true a true anarchist. And he developed a lot of, did a lot of things in Bitcoin that I think were interesting and important early on, particularly MPEX. Yes, MPEX. And I don't think <laughs> most Bitcoiners will ever, I couldn't use MPEX because I don't know how to program well, and you, well, I, I looked at it, I was like, so this is a unusable NASDAQ that is, <laughs> that is command line based? Like, how the, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? And I'd look at it like, how do I trade on this? Like, I want to. I, I shouldn't have wanted to, but I was dumber back then. Uh, but, uh, but it was interesting at the very least. Mm-hmm. And he was, I think, the first guy to really kind of... I, I think he's the first person that that bought and held Bitcoin for the right reasons. Interesting. I think everyone else before him was doing it for ideological reasons or did Could it buy f- drugs or something. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Did it for did it for the wrong reasons, like 
you know, I think a lot of libertarians have these theories about why Bitcoin's going to go up. And then when Bitcoin goes up, they think that validates their theories. Mm. Uh, and they could very well hold Bitcoin and buy it and become billionaires and have all the have, have held it for all the wrong reasons. Mm. But I think Mercha knew exactly why he was holding it. And uh, I think, yeah, I think that Bitcoin in light of that is for... Uh, for you and me, mm. you know, it's for buying palaces with sex slaves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you so something profound was coming out, didn't uh, you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was a nice reversal there on the joke. Um, yeah, I gotta say, you, 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 you do bring a lot of that energy. But let's, let's go back to Bitcoin Uncensored, because you, you did have that podcast for a while. Yeah. And it was sort of like the og bitcoin podcast so there was of course like let's talk bitcoin and all of that but yeah. it was kind of boring compared to bitcoin uncensored everybody yeah. listened to bitcoin uncensored back in what like 2015 2016 yes. somewhere around there yeah. anyone uh, who mattered mm -hmm. yeah I mean, so bruce so, fenton <laughs> particular in particular well so so tell me about what 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 made you guys like make that kind of show because for me it's it's sort of like the OG Godfather podcast, and it's yeah. a, it, it was such a sad day when it went away. It was the right, it was the right moment. So I, 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 it was, it was very obvious to me that Bitcoin Uncensored was art, and I treated it as such. And uh, my co-host at the time, Chris, I, I don't know that he saw it quite that way. Mm -hmm. And I thought the podcast ended perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, the question of whether or not I am a scammer <laughs> was <laughs> was the right question to end on. <laughs> Um, I, I, well, I, I guess we have different definitions of perfectly, but I, well, I always was, thought it was, it was the, so it was sad. The, it was sad, but it was the signature on the painting. Mm. Like you had to, like, it meant it was, it was the right question to end on. Mm. And it was, am I a scammer over Pepe's? <laughs> and I'm happy to let people think upon that and have whatever opinion they want. Mm -hmm. Um, I have my own opinion mm -hmm. and, uh, I, the record, I think, is on my side, but I don't care. <laughs> like, it just doesn't matter. And I think it was the perfect sign off on the show. Mm. Um, what made us do that show? I mean, like that was it was the show that Bitcoin needed. Mm. Bitcoin, Bitcoin needed a show about who Bitcoin users were, and we we didn't really try to build. We just didn't. We just got in front of a camera and had the same discussions that we had every day. And we just always thought that it was interesting because like, you know, if we were in a group and we were having the discussion, we'd be sitting around a table like, you know, kind of like this. Mm -hmm. And I'd be telling fart jokes and, <laughs> and, and talking about Bitcoin and people would be laughing and mm -hmm. they'd come back to the meetups for, you know, the humor and the fun and the Bitcoin discussion. And, um, and it just translated well to audio. Mm. And, and then in addition, we were just interested, frankly, in exploring what Bitcoin was and we were doing it in our backyard, you know? So like, it wasn't like we set out to make a big show. It was just, if it, it got big, but it was, it was apart from us. Like we, we didn't realize how many people were listening or how important it was in the mm -hmm. space until all of a sudden it was. And we had like, particularly like during Segwit 2X and stuff like that, we had people flying down, like trying to petition us mm -hmm. to like change our opinions on, <laughs> on, on Segwit. And Chris, Chris and I would like laugh. We'd like, what, like, what the fuck is going on? Like, why are they doing that? Like, we just run a small podcast. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like why, why do they think that our opinion matters? Mm -hmm. And I, I still think that. I think it's hilarious that anybody could ever think that like we were influential in any of that. And I, I guess we were, mm -hmm. but not on purpose, and not um, not not in the way that other people seem to think we were. And well, I guess in my mind, I I, I don't think that we were, but we, we probably were. But it it's weird because it was while sitting in our underwear on the internet in our backyard. Like it was just it was a very weird. Right, right, fact. Well, well, so I, I I'm gonna push back a little bit because you guys flew to Cancun and like hid out in the bathroom of like one of the like no uh, no 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 the, I, I forget no, which Jimmy. one it was but no, you no, no, no. you recorded we everything drove, from a bank uh, we uh, drove bathroom. north mm -hmm. to Port St Lucie mm -hmm. which is like 30 minutes mm -hmm. from where we live mm -hmm. and that's where the Satoshi Roundtable was. Mm. <laughs> 
<laughs> in our backyard again. Uh-huh. <laughs> everything was in our backyard. I mean, like Bitcoin was in our backyard. Everything. Uh, the Bitcoin bowl was in mm. our backyard. We just kind of happened to live in the right spot for all of this, and we just did adventures because, like, who you know, it was fun, mm. and we just recorded it. I mean, there's like I think Chris was very interested in being known in Bitcoin, mm. and when we started off, I wasn't at all. You know, mm. like the fame for me uh, was a zero. Mm-hmm. I didn't really want to be known. And Bitcoin famous is not like real famous. It's not like Justin Bieber famous. <laughs> right? It's like, um, it's like, how, how do you say it? Like, it's like famous among all of the worst people in the world. You know? like, <laughs> the worst people in the world. You're, okay. Mostly your listeners. Uh, um, uh, yeah, no. I'm sure they're going to appreciate that. One. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, it's not Justin Bieber famous. It's very like, it's it's very weird because like I, you you have a large amount of acclaim among a t- very tiny group of people. Mm. So like you go to you go to a restaurant and like all thirty seven Bitcoiners are there and they all know you. Mm-hmm. You're very famous to mm. those thirty seven people, but nowhere outside of the table, they're like who the fuck is that? Yeah. So like, that's, <laughs> that's how it feels. Um, You're a micro celebrity. Something uh, like that. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. Bitcoin, only. it's like very <laughs> very small. <laughs> nowhere outside of Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Um, but what was I saying? Uh, well, uh, we were, we were talking about Bitcoin uncensored. Well, I know that. It work and all that, yeah. Uh, oh, the, 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 so yeah, but most of the stuff was in our backyard. So the, mm-hmm. the Bitcoin bowl was there. Mm-hmm. Um, Bruce Fenton did his Satoshi Roundtable there. Uh, you know, the Bitcoin conference in Miami. Mm-hmm. Uh, and honestly, the, and that just, one's like the most debaucherous one like on a year to year basis. Yeah, well that yeah. you know now it's taken over by Bitcoin Magazine, so it's yeah. professionalized a little bit. Mm-hmm. But back then it was uh, run by Mo Levin, whom I love. Love Mo. Uh who used to call Pumper Mo. We like Mo. I had never been to that conference. Really? You got to you got you got to tell us a little bit more about like what what that was like. It was just early Bitcoin. Uh it was where the Ethereum uh the Ethereum launch was first announced mm-hmm. in I think what 2014. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. And that, I mean, that was a weird conference because Bitcoin had gone from like seven dollars to a thousand over yeah. the course of that time. Ten, ten to a thousand. And this is that, yeah. right before Mount Gox, right before. So January like, 2014. Yeah. yeah, I remember this. It was mm-hmm. Bitcoin was sitting around eight hundred bucks, mm-hmm. and it you know had gotten there from like seven dollars. So mm-hmm. it was crazy time, mm-hmm. and. The conference went from being like this little known weird conference to <laughs> ballooning. Mm-hmm. Like they went from like them thinking they had to have like one room mm-hmm. to having, I don't know, thousands of people show up, mm-hmm. thousands. And it was packed like mm-hmm. you wouldn't believe. And I remember like the the conference area where they had like people <clears throat> uh, trying to advertise. It was a very small area. Like it was clear that this conference was scheduled for like. 500 of us at Mm -hmm. most Mm -hmm. and maybe 300 and it had just turned out that like everyone in the world wanted to go figure out what this thing that had just pumped from seven dollars to a thousand dollars in the course of like six months like what Mm -hmm. the hell was this so you know we get there i remember it was very funny to me because i was uh they had a vc panel Mm -hmm. which was absurd at the time because like a vc (laughs) panel there was no one it was literally like bitcoin was like free Uh like months before and I remember sitting there, and, and and by the way, this is what's funny about Bitcoin is at every point when you get in, you always think that you missed out on the early part. <laughs> That's right. So like I remember, I got in about one week after the pizza, and I was like, oh, I just wish I'd been here sooner. I probably missed all the good parts. <laughs> <laughs> in retrospect, is hilariously absurd, but uh, but I get there and like the, the VCs had like a different perspective. It wasn't like I wish I'd gotten in earlier. The VCs were like, I was so early. Um, I got in when Bitcoin was around uh, $113. And I remember <laughs> I had to turn to Chris, I'm like, three months ago? <laughs> like, That's right. What? Yeah. He's like, I was one of the first VCs in the space. I got in when Bitcoin was around $113. <laughs> it's like, I was like, I couldn't believe that these people uh, would, would be so brash as to show up and, and think that they were early when they were so late, but now 2014, if you say you're here class of 2014, you were early, very early. And yeah. like every class it's, it is, it is a class. Every class that comes in is remarkably 
like at this point at this point you are there's there's like levels to being a bitcoiner and one of them is how many pumps have you been through mm. you know that's like like what, what were you in the were you in the pump of 2012 and the pump <laughs> of 2014 and the pump of 2017 how many you've been through and like the mini pump cycles and whatnot and like bitcoiners just learn a lot from like money's their money going up and down and up and down and the volatility is just a monster that like teaches lessons and i just think it's it's just really was a was an incredible conference uh in retrospect but at the time i don't think i knew what what quite what i was looking at like i, I still don't think so. i mean I, honestly like I, have you ever seen the john adams hbo documentary i think so yeah. there's this moment where he's like brought in to like look at this like giant painting mm. and He's like, there was never a moment when all of the founders got together and signed the Declaration <laughs> of Independence. After all these people came in, whenever they were free and they signed it on their, their way through town, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, the real history of the revolution has been lost. And I think that's kind of how Bitcoin is. I think mm. that like we are in a revolution and it's a quasi silent revolution and it's slow moving and uh we are the revolutionaries and I, I think people don't quite realize that but like the real history in some ways has been lost and uh it'll continue to be lost and just kind of those of us who tell the stories like i i, I in, in my perspective for me like with bu or like mm -hmm. afterwards i very much view myself my responsibility is to tell the stories in ways that will be remembered which is why i think the humor element is so important mm -hmm. because like i could I can tell the story in the like we had two heroin addicts come in and put needles in their arm and it was very sad or I can tell the story and make you laugh about it and mm -hmm. and make you remember it um that was an episode by the way we did that that was <laughs> a big mistake <laughs> <laughs> is the yeah, worst, uh, yeah, you worst probably mistake. don't want junkies in your studio. No, it was a very bad idea. Yeah. I thought they were going to die, and then I thought we were going to like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> they nodded off. It was, Florida, man. Woo! Yeah, <laughs> We did a lot of bad things, mistakes. Uh -huh. um, but uh, but I, I do think that like telling the story of Bitcoin and the story of early Bitcoin in, in true but like humorous ways is, is the only way to like make sure the sticks because i see it like i see people telling the story of bitcoin i see netflix documentarians trying to tell the story of bitcoin i see you know and they just they're just they just get it wrong mm. like charlie shrum he wasn't an early part of bitcoin history just kidding i was trying to write him out of <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say <laughs> pretty sure he was there pretty early buddy he was just not not important <laughs> no the the charlie Sherman. i mean like it's interesting like there are there are a lot of but like you know bitcoin bitcoin's gone through so many uh like there's just so many things that have happened and like the question what's what's interesting for me is kind of living through the history mm. is trying to figure out what it is that is important to remember mm. like the ico pump last mm -hmm. cycle like is that worth remembering because i think what will happen is 10 years from now nobody will remember icos mm. nobody and it was a it, all consuming portion of Bitcoin mm. for a year. Mm. And no one cares now. <laughs> no one cares. Like you you honestly like we're doing it again with NFTs. Mm -hmm. And and like everyone's telling me that this is revolutionizing the art market. And I'm like, okay, like I know what's <laughs> gonna happen. This is like no one's gonna remember this in three to five years. Mm -hmm. And we're like, remember NFTs? <laughs> we were so dumb. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you didn't have to be. You could have understood the tech. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to be dumb. Like this is, it's a very weird time. And everything is like, it's sort of the reification of like buzzword surfing. Mm -hmm. You see these these buzzwords, you're like, oh, AI, oh, VR, oh, blah, blah, blah. And then like someone comes by and is like, we could combine these uh -huh. and we could make something really valuable for a short time and we'll make a bunch of money off it and then people forget how big of, an, like how much of an asshole we were for like starting this thing and taking all of these, the money of these children from their parents. So like, and, that, and that's what NFTs are. Like, it's just incredible that like we, we have this era where there's going to be so much money that is pumped into this stuff. And it, it is literally, you are living the tulip bubble in real time um, with something far less consequential and far more money at stake and uh the consequences will be far more dire and nobody will remember it 
unlike the tulip bubble, which probably didn't even happen. Well, I, so are you suggesting that where it's all going to get whitewashed away or like no one's going to be motivated to remember or what? I don't know if it's a motivation. It's just mm. that like, I think that these are not historically important. Mm. Like these are just stories of like pure greed, selfishness and misunderstanding of what is going on. And like the NFTs in particular are interesting. Like think about it. Like how much do you know about Beanie Babies? I don't, I, I don't, I I didn't own any, so I don't. Do you know what they are? Yeah, of course. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. And you know there was like a bubble. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever, did your mom participate, friends? Mm, yeah. yeah. And so Beanie Babies are a good example of this. Like it really was an all-consuming bubble mm. for a good four and a half, five years mm. in America and in other parts of the world, all-consuming. Mm. Like there are people that literally gave their entire wealth away mm. to this stuffed animal bubble. <laughs> and... It is literally now, 15, 20, 25 years later, just a footnote. Mm -hmm. Nobody remembers it. And I think that's a lot of this stuff in Bitcoin. I think it's very easy to be myopic about the thing that's happening right now in Bitcoin, the thing that's happening in Ethereum, where like years ago was the thing that's happening in BitShares, Daniel Larimer was going around and saying to everybody like, the future is proof of stake. You can yeah. know it because the top six coins, four of them are proof of stake. <laughs> and you're like, oh, well that's very reasonable. And then they dropped off and BitShares disappeared. Daniel Larimer went on to a new project. And like it's just it just kind of like nobody remembers it. It just kind of rolls on, like it well, do, never do happened. Pe do you think people know who da Daniel Larimer is? They at this did point? at the time. Yeah, I, I mean, do you he's remember, obviously I was done told like for years five. that BitShares is going to flip Bitcoin. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I doubt it. Like it just doesn't make any sense. But like for for months and months and years, I had to hear this. And then the same people when Larimer left that project and he went on to the new project, was it Tezos or, that he went on to EOS? EOS. 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 He goes on to EOS and they all follow him and they're like, well, he's made me a lot of money. I was like, yeah, but I thought... Bitch oh, no, no, he did Steam first. He did do Steam. For, yeah. I think he kind of did Steam. I think he like farted on Steam. So he like <laughs> wafted on it. And then he like moved on to EOS. Uh -huh. So like, yeah, he would, what do you call it? Crop dusting? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Crop dusting Steam. <laughs> okay, there's our fart joke. Yeah, yeah we, we, need, we need that, that fart joke. That would be the only one. Mm -hmm. So uh, he cropped us steam and then he moves on to EOS. And like, I remember hear, hearing people and they would say like, oh, I'm moving, I'm buying a bunch of EOS. You're like, why? Well, Daniel Larimer's really returned a lot of money to me in, you know, the form of bit shares. And I'm like, well, bit shares is like a 5% of the value. Well, yeah, but I sold when he said he was leaving <laughs> the project. I'm like, but before that, you said that it was going to flip the project. And then you had this like changing of like ethos. Mm. And it was all of a sudden these people turned from I'm I'm here to like flip Bitcoin to like I'm here to follow Dan because he makes me money on his projects and I don't care what these projects do. <laughs> and that's really like and that describes and Miami right. in a nutshell. They were, they were fucking right. Like look at it. EOS made them a ton of money. Mm. And that's the thing. Like you can you can follow these guys from project to project and they seem to go up and they they are worthless. Mm. Like ultimately in the long run, they are worthless, but in the short run, they make you lots of money. And I'm, it's, it's a struggle in Bitcoin. And I think this is where the despondency you were talking about earlier comes from. It's a struggle in Bitcoin to realize that you're in it for the long run while all these people are making like tons of money mm. in the short run. Mm. And, uh, and, and the question you have to ask is whether your principles matter or if you should be grabbing free money that you know is out there because like you know that you know nfts will happen or mm -hmm. you know that um you know whatever just like well you, you can you, know that you can identify the pump cycle by paying attention basically is what yeah. you're talking about yeah but is it more like what what makes you sort of envy these people that are making a lot of that money i don't envy mm -hmm. any of them mm -hmm. but i think that people do and i think that's what drives the pumps mm. um i mean like we I, I make little bets occasionally just for fun. Like I've, I've been buying up some mana, putting it up hundred dollars a week. So big money. And, uh, and that's because like, I, I strongly anticipate that at some point in the future, these, uh, ridiculous VCs are going to pump this narrative of Decentraland and like the, <laughs> the whole like matrix, plug yourself into the matrix. 
And that's because they always, they did, they did this last time too. They always forecast what the next pump is. In the last, the ICO cycle, we had crypto kitties and, mm. you know, coming out of rare Pepe. And, you know, they forecast it. So then like in this cycle, now they're doing the NFTs. It's like, okay, well, what's the next cycle? They, they prepare it, this pump. And I think mm. that the central, the sort of like the centrally, what do you call it? Uh, web 2, Web 3, mm -hmm. Web 3.0. Mm -hmm. what, what do they actually call it? Web 3. Web 3, VR. Or metaverse. Metaverse. Or yeah. The metaverse shit. Like, I think that's probably where they're going to go next. Mm -hmm. And I mean, maybe, but mm -hmm. there might be another, it might be another thing, but like they, these scams just continue. They roll on and then like the next so cycle. So you're getting just, in on the scam before it happens. I just, <laughs> it doesn't, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't care. I don't <laughs> mind people like jumping on board. What I, what I do think though, is like these people that don't do it with irony. Mm. If you do it with no irony, where like you're understanding that like this mm. is bullshit, mm. like that's a problem. I think mm. like you you are you are buying you're you're believing and eating your own shit. <laughs> um, like Bitcoin is not ironic. Bitcoin works. Bitcoin mm. does what it does. But these other things, like like I mean NFTs, mm. Ethereum, none of these things have any purpose. Mm. They don't work. They don't do anything. I don't know what you think of them. Like, do you, do you think there's? Do you, I, I, I tend to. Th I, 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 you're you're a maximalist, right? Like, yeah. I, I mean, you 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 know my I, my view. I think. Uh, I, I I do I do presume to know your view, but mm -hmm. I just I figure it's better to confirm because <laughs> you know how often it is where I talk to Bitcoiners and I presume they're maximalists. I've known them for a while, and mm -hmm. then they're like, "Oh no, I like shit coins." Mm -hmm. That doesn't actually happen very often. But, <laughs> <laughs> it <laughs> does happen. My, my my circle of friends is mostly maxis, <laughs> but like, uh, but. But yeah, like you're a maxi, mm -hmm. um, I'm a maxi, and and I I just I I struggle because I, I try to get people to articulate what these things are good for, mm. and it's very obvious that they're good for nothing, mm -hmm. but that doesn't matter to anybody, and uh, I mean the DeFi stuff is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. This entire thing, this the entirety of DeFi, is glued together by a problematic pegged product that will depeg and destroy the entirety of the infrastructure <laughs> like it's obvious it doesn't take much to understand in the long run that has to happen mm -hmm. maybe it'll fail for some other reason like mm -hmm. I, I i've had a history of predicting failures for the wrong reasons <laughs> like where like something dumber will happen like uh -huh. they'll they'll allow someone to go into the repo and delete it mm -hmm. accidentally you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. so that's happened that kind of thing has happened but like i it, it, with 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 DeFi, there's this like long problem where like these pegs that run the thing could become unpegged mm -hmm. and collapse all of DeFi. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in spite of that obvious flaw and very obvious coming problem, nobody cares. They still <laughs> like, they're still doing it. Mm -hmm. Like they're not accomplishing anything. They, they literally have not solved any problems in that space. And uh, they've recreated wall street products without any of the regulatory like infrastructure or and any of the base products that produce the, yes. <laughs> value <laughs> uh -huh. and uh and they're just they're just getting return for literally no reason and it's very funny because you look at it you're like well like anyone can participate in that and make money um for a while but it's just a it's a game of hot potato or musical chairs and you don't know when it's when the party's going to end, and it probably won't end tomorrow or the next day. But when it does end, it's going to be very devastating for a lot of people. Mm. And I, it's just it's just weird to me. Like it's it's hard for me to like want to participate in that. Mm. Um, I'm not excited about it, even though like lots of people are making a lot of money in it, at least in the short term. Mm. I don't think they know when to pull out. Well, I mean that, that's a good that's way to have children. <laughs> You saw well, that coming. That was too easy. Was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I won't go there at the moment. But uh, it, it it is interesting. Your perspective is very different than, I think, the typical one in Austin. Because I, I think you do see a lot of this stuff in Miami where you have a lot of these basically like uh, DeFi bros or whatever making a crap ton of money. And they're all driving really nice cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lambos or Teslas. Or something. Everything. I mean, like, it's the Aston Martins, the Lamborghinis, mm -hmm. the, like, money, whatever Bugattis. they're called. Bugattis. I don't know anything about cars. Mm -hmm. I was looking the other day, I drove I drove by a lot, and it was, like, a black people car lot. 
And I was looking, I was like, that car's $4,000. I could buy that car. Mm-hmm. I, could, I could even afford that car. Uh-huh. And I looked at my wife and I go, I, th- I think my next car is going to be one of those. Uh-huh. And she was not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I struggle I struggle with it because like, I look at it and I'm like, you know, I just can't justify like mm. a $60,000 or $90,000 car, no matter how much I have, especially when I like, do the math on how much you pay per mile and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I was like, I could buy that. Like, my, 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 my preference has been to like downgrade the car mm. as much as I can, start at like a Tesla and then like got a Volvo and then maybe I'll get like a BMW next and then like a 1982 Toyota Camry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if you can. <laughs> buy those that's gonna be difficult <laughs> be 40 year old camry <laughs> i don't know they last a long time jimmy wow but like i do i do think it's it, yeah there's a lot of money being thrown around and, and sloshing around in a lot of places like miami and it's 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 interesting to look at because like these people don't understand the technology mm. and that, that really isn't relevant mm-hmm. to like the, well, the, the technology side. has never really mattered in any of that not stuff. not to getting rich yeah. it matters to like understanding the long mm-hmm. the long view but there, there, was there ever a long view? <laughs> there is in my mind. Yeah. I mean, my, my perspective has always been that this only matters if it is, if if the long view matters. Mm. And I don't know that I've articulated that, but like that, that really is the case. Like it doesn't matter if Ethereum is around for 15 years. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if BitShares is around for 10 years. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if like Tezos takes a big part of the market share. Or Ripple wins its lawsuit, mm-hmm. or Craig Wright wins another lawsuit claiming he's Satoshi. Mm-hmm. Like none of these really matter. Mm-hmm. The only thing that really matters in the long run is is what is, what lasts, what lasts. And mm-hmm. and it's kind of a Christian argument, right? Like the mm-hmm. idea that like, in in the sort of Christian mythology, you go before God, and your deeds are burned. I mean, you're. You wrote, you wrote the book on Jesus, so. <laughs> known as the Bible. Well, so I, I was mad at you for not including me, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you go before God, and your deeds, and and you know, you're, you're th- they're burned, uh-huh. right? And then what's left, you know, right, right, the refiner's like fire, yeah, exactly. So, um, the only thing that matters is what lasts that fire, right? And there is kind of this Christian element to Bitcoin in that way, and that like you have all of these things that are uh, competing for that spot on like the the throne of God. Mm. And the question is whether it matters. Mm. Like you can have a bunch of people who like are you know trying to compete for that position, but the only thing that matters is who is like king mm. and who is likely to be king mm. forever and ever. Mm. Or if there is a maybe like, and and the idea of in, in money, and I know what you're thinking, if you're listening, you're like, well, why can't you just switch the king every couple of years? Well, <laughs> and the pro- the reason is, is because in money, this idea that you have to like maintain an incredibly high interest in the news and goings on of the day, lest you become completely worthless. Like, can you imagine like, oh, well, Bitcoin worked for a while, but we've all, all of us new millennials have decided that like ethereum is better so we're just gonna like switch to that and then if you don't switch in time bitcoiner you're poor (laughs) haha and then the next generation's like we like tezos Mm -hmm. and then you know the next is like we like doge and you have to you have to you'd have to maintain this like very close view on which money you have to be in in order to like maintain your wealth like Mm. if that's the state of the world this project is dead Mm. it doesn't matter so buy your Bugattis with your Ethereum gains and <laughs> know that this will come to an end eventually as a whole. But if it does matter, that means you can really only have one winner, mm. in my opinion. And like the only one that makes any sense is Bitcoin. Mm. Well, well said. The The idea that, you know, you can sort of switch things is kind of this very postmodern mentality right of well, thinking that we can make reality happen rather than based on you know the actual underlying fundamentals yeah. of it well in economic economics economics mm-hmm. economics <laughs> in economics you have this idea of the switching costs right mm-hmm. and and i can't think of something more expensive in mm-hmm. terms of switching costs than money mm-hmm. like if you have to switch your money every two years like, <laughs> it's just ridiculous it's just a ridiculous notion and you know fundamentally like, I think I think people that are new to the space need to understand that all of these chains are competing for exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, so if they're not competing for the same thing, then they're competing for essentially f the, the st status is best fiat, right? Mm -hmm. Fiat being like, you know, made by order of the state essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Or a wonderful car brand that I'll buy an 1992 <laughs> version of. But like, um, you know, if you're a proof of stake coin, you, you exist at the beneficence of like, at the you know at the, you you exist as a result of the, these old holders who have a lot, mm. and uh, and they perpetuate the coin and they get more mm -hmm. and they become wealthier, and the people that are new, they don't, mm -hmm. they get screwed. So the the, the Canalon effect is like alive and well in like a proof of stake system, right? Mm -hmm. So proof of stake has Canalon, but the other coins that are proof of work. Like this idea that like they're any different because like one coin uses a different algorithm mm -hmm. than another coin is hilarious because all these <laughs> algorithms are doing is providing a receipt for uh -huh. energy burnt. Uh -huh. Like that's all it is. So if if one is like, well, our receipt is pink, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like Dash is like, our receipt is pink, and you're uh -huh. like, uh, okay. And like Bitcoin's like, well, ours ours is white because that was like this is the thing. But like Bitcoin's the cheapest, right? Mm -hmm. Bitcoin's the cheapest receipt. It's the white paper mm -hmm. from the, like the thermal printer. Mm -hmm. So like that's the Bitcoin receipt. Others are like, we have a color printer printing the receipt. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more expensive. So like all of these chains are competing for the exact same thing, mm -hmm. and I fail to understand how that makes them anything less than out of consensus Bitcoin forks, mm -hmm. right? Like they're just all they're all competing for energy. And the one who spends the energy the best and, you know, manages the commons of the blockchain the best, I, I can't imagine why that one doesn't win. Mm. And there's only one chain that has concerned itself with that. Mm. All the others have, like, made it their mission to be, like, to, to mismanage the commons. <laughs> that is, like, the, the, the pitch of BCH, right? Mm -hmm. That is the pitch of BSV. That is the pitch of, like, basically every coin. Other than, you know... I mean, that, that's actually kind of the pitch of Monero, too. Mm -hmm. Like, the ring signatures are too big for, like... Uh, you know, you, you, it's it's pollution. It's chain pollution. So like you have that on Bitcoin, you, it would never work with this many users. Mm -hmm. So Monero is a good experiment, but Bitcoin couldn't do it. Um, BSV, BCH, like their whole thing is like as big a blocks as possible. The only reason they don't collapse is because nobody uses them. <laughs> so, but like the whole, the pitch to blockchainers has been come to us because we are the worst managers of like the commons. <laughs> And this is a very compelling pitch to, to, to people in blockchain because they don't know what they're looking at. <laughs> and I find that very humorous. Like we put, we have the most dicks drawn, we have the most space for dicks to be drawn on our blockchain. Mm -hmm. Come to us. And they're like, that sounds great. Honestly, like <laughs> that, <laughs> that's a blockchain I can get behind. <laughs> well, I, 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 the trade off to me is you're, you're talking about managing the commons. So with Bitcoin, it's nobody's managing it. It's each user is sovereign over their own node and everything else. With BCH, it's like, okay, well, we're going to set the rules and you got you have to trust us. And that's the case with all of these other ones. That that seems to not get through to people, this idea that there is a trade-off between centralization and these technical features. That well, Bitcoiners for. need to realize that most people aren't ideological like mm. they are, right? Like, mm. here's the thing. You come to Bitcoin... You're a normal human being. You're my, you're, <laughs> your dad, you know, because your dad's probably, he's probably a Korean, like, mm -hmm. uh, tiger father. <laughs> Jimmy, why you do, why you not be more important? You know, something like that. That's offensive, but I know how they are. So, <laughs> Jim, why don't you get A in Bitcoin? You know, why are you not doing piano? You know, stuff like that. So, like, that's your dad. And he comes to Bitcoin. <laughs> Sure, he's a nice guy. Dad, if you're watching this, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, a, that's more of a Chinese, a fake Chinese accent. So I'm a, fr a friend like... Uh, yeah, he kind of... It's offensive on many levels. It is sure, super yeah. offensive. But... Uh, <laughs> I've been working... I'll get to that in a second. But like, so your dad comes to Bitcoin and he's not, he's not thinking to himself like, boy... You know what I really need? An anti-state uh, kind of money that's going to subvert the government and change everything I know 
and like just make the world a very different place when everybody stops using that shitty green US dollar. <laughs> you know, like it doesn't exist, right? Like mm -hmm. th that person is like, there's like 11 of those people and mm -hmm. they're all here. They got here early. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so when people come to Bitcoin, they're not, they're not thinking like that. Um, they're, they're coming here and they're kind of like, oh, it's an investment, mm. you know, and they're, they're buying it on, they're buying it because they think it's like IBM, <laughs> like a blue chip, right? They're like, this has been around a while now. It's not going away. I should mm. buy some of this Bitcoin company stock mm. and they're buying it. And they're like, Coinbase is the only place that sells it. Don't know what Coinbase is, <laughs> but I'll buy some of that Bitcoin stock uh -huh. and like, oh, GBTC, that's some of the Bitcoin company stock. Mm -hmm. I'll buy some of that. And so like, that's why they're here. And this idea that like you could convince those people mm -hmm. that like the thing they need to worry about is, well, you know, Ethereum is like, it's got like three f full nodes all on <laughs> AWS. And like, well, they're just like, well, but the Ethereum company and the Bitcoin company, they're just competing with each other for, you know, IBM bucks. You know, like, like, I don't know what they think the business is, but like they don't, they don't have, they, they can't conceptualize it. They mm. can't like articulate what these things do. Mm. And, uh, and that's why when your dad comes to Bitcoin, he doesn't find the decentralization stuff very, <laughs> very he doesn't find the decentralization stuff very important. Mm. And, uh, and, and that's, that's the reality of most people. Like that's going to be the case for going forward. Like the, the thing that is important about this stuff is that we have to set it up correctly now because this is this is a, a revolutionary time bomb. And if you don't set it up correctly at the outset, the the, what the square of the errors bec it propagates. Yeah. It, it was so what is it, the square of the error, whatever, they, whatever they, that phrase is, but it, it propagates yeah. it, generationally, right? Yeah. It goes into the next generation set up poorly. And the next generation is not going to have a deep understanding of why this stuff is important mm. or they'll have less of an understanding because in their world, it's always been mm. this way. Like we've had Bitcoin our whole lives, mm. you know, that'll be the thought of the next generation and like they can corrupt it very easily. So we have to set it up very, very correctly at the outset because most of the people that are going to come here don't understand what is important about this kind of discovery. And Bitcoin is a discovery. I mean, like, make no, no uh, bones about it. Well, I mean, I, hopefully that's why we write books and uh, produce content and stuff like that. But, I mean, do you really think that people are that ignorant about it? At yeah. least the people that are getting in. Yeah. Most people don't. It's not a compelling narrative to most people that we're going to subvert the government. It's not. Well, not about subverting government, but no, having unseizable money or something. It's, like not, that. it's not that compelling. Their their money is unseizable now to them. Like, well, why would I need that? I mm -hmm. only have eighty seven dollars that I carry around. <laughs> like, oh, it's seizable. Ooh, I've lost eighty seven dollars. <laughs> Whoa, Jimmy, great. Most of my money's in Vanguard. You know, mm. um, so like this this notion that you know, particularly to Americans, that this is like something that they should care about is is very sort of unintuitive. Mm. It like it's online cash so what you know we have venmo <laughs> like okay well you know th th then you have to go through like the, th the exercise like well why don't you try to send some venmo to somalia mm. try it oh, it doesn't work mm. you know like but you can send it to your friend in texas mm -hmm. so like we have this portable money amongst friends and it's very difficult to kind of step out and realize that like there's a whole globe out there that actually needs this and uh, and it's important to them, and it's important to people that are trying to send money to them, like you know, Minnesotan Somalians or something like that, need to send their money to a Somalian Somalian, uh -huh. and um, and they can't, mm. and so that's like a very difficult thing to understand if you're not living in that milieu, mm. and uh, and I think that like Bitcoin, like new newcomers are going to have a lot of trouble because they're not here ideologically, like Bitcoiners originally were, mm. and maybe they turn into ideologues but I bet not. I bet most people don't. Like government is a comfortable mistress, you know? <laughs> like we like we like what it does for the most part. Well, I would challenge that a little bit. I, I, I do feel like there's a lot of people that are getting concerned about inflation, about all the money printing, all the stuff that's going on in government. And they are coming in ideologically slightly differently than maybe the early people, but it does feel like some, some people are coming in that way. Well, that, I, I see that on both sides, that there are people that are concerned about the money printing, but that's mm -hmm. not like, 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 honestly, it's not what Bitcoin solves. 
The money printing? No. Like, like here's the thing, Jimmy. What if what if we do the money printing now, right? Mm -hmm. And we get a little inflation. It gets a little bit hard. You gotta, you know, pay a little bit more for the green beans. And then it kind of just levels out, and then we're back to like a normal three or four percent growth. You really think it'll level out? I, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> let's, let's say it does. I mean, this happened before. We've had mm -hmm. bad inflation, and then it has leveled out again. Let's say it does. Let's say it levels out, and everything kind of goes back to normal. Like, Bitcoin still exists in that world, but those people are going to be like, okay, it seems like I was a little bit aggressive here. I, I didn't need to be so scared of what was happening. The government's fine. Mm -hmm. Like, Bitcoin, Bitcoin does solve the issues created by money printing if it's money. Mm -hmm. But like, in my view, like Bitcoin's sort of in this process of monetizing where it's like not really money yet. It's not good money yet. I think it's good. Money, but I, I, well, I would disagree. <laughs> the, the money that, that you hold is, it's, mm -hmm. it's bad if it can go down 50% in a day. You don't want that, right? That's, that's like a huge amount of inflation. It, in you, I mean, you can, it also doubles in. Yes, like you, few, which you do whatever, want. Right, but then, yeah. like, <laughs> that's, that's my point. But that, like, I mean, this, it's Bitcoin's kind of hyper, risk reward. I, I think that is, I think that is the process of monetization mm -hmm. that like mm -hmm. Bitcoin is like hyper volatile. There's like huge disagreements socially about like where it should be. Mm -hmm. And like, it's, it's difficult to hold on a day to day basis because mm -hmm. of that. Like if you, if you're like trying to spend it, like that's your only currency that you're holding. If you have a lot of it from the early days, it's a little easier. Mm -hmm. But like if what you have is, like you're just you just bought it you just mm -hmm. took your paycheck you put it in at sixty thousand and then Bitcoin goes to you know forty thousand you just lost a lot of value and you have to like pay your bills this month <laughs> like so 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 Bitcoin is monetizing mm -hmm. it's getting there I think that it is on the path to being good money mm. I think it is the only thing that has a shot at being good money in fact I, I I've said before I think it is the only thing in the world that could be money. Like, I don't think we've had money before. I think this is the first time we've <laughs> ever actually had money. First time, first time in the history of man. I do I think so. Really? I do. Yeah. Well, think about it. Well, it like, dep depends on how you define money, but yeah. Well, I, yeah. Um, we've had medium as, mediums of exchange. And I think generally people have thought of like mediums of exchange as like, that is money, right? But I, I don't think so. I think, I think when I think about like the the history of money we have like this history where money's been gold and money's been mm -hmm. this and money's been that and we've kind of like over time developed this list of things that like mm -hmm. money has these like seven features it mm -hmm. must be x and it must be y and it must be mm -hmm. z mm -hmm. um and then along comes like paper money mm -hmm. and fiat and you're like oh okay and it like well first of all it's tied to gold and you're like mm -hmm. oh, okay so like we have we can represent Mm -hmm. gold with paper so that's good because gold is money mm. right so then we represent gold with paper and then all of a sudden the united states is like shit we're going bankrupt <laughs> decouple mm -hmm. and so we get off the gold standard and we find out that money can maintain value even without backing mm -hmm. and we're like oh wow what is this thing like oh all we need is a ledger mm -hmm. huh so the dollars are like this good proxy for a ledger mm -hmm. it's been pretty good but then bitcoin comes along and it's like you know what like we remove everything we remove the central control we remove everything Mm. And all we are is like a global ledger. Mm. So if that was really good as like a proxy ledger, mm -hmm. like this is perfect. This is a perfect ledger. Mm. And like to me, like when you remove all of those sort of uh, elements of danger mm. that existed in things like the dollar, those central points of failure, you you have what to me looks like literally naturally created money mm. that came out of the ground like oil. <laughs> <laughs> to me is like if that's true i think what happened is people had spent all this time thinking about what money is and the byzantine general's problem was solved and like some orange crude started going <laughs> and was like that looks a lot like the thing we theorized is called money uh. <laughs> and they like picked it up and licked it and they're like yeah it tastes like money too that's weird and they like and now we're just kind of watching the rest of the world figure out that that's what it is mm. And it's going to be volatile until maybe forever, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe at some point it like levels out and actually is like really good secure money that kind of just increases at the rate of like global expansion. Yeah. I, I, I don't know like if it'll ever be steady with respect to the dollar, because if Bitcoin takes over, I think the dollar, I don't know, so something's going to happen to but regardless, um, let's let's switch topics a little bit because doing it. All right. So you you've um, 
What what have you been up to more recently? Because you you did do Bitcoin Uncensored for a while, yeah, and uh, and you know you've been living in Miami. Uh-huh. I think you got married, you know, I did you know all that stuff? Like what what's been going on with you? Uh, uh, mostly, uh, not much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have a business down there. I run a home security company, mm-hmm. a little business. I, I think work is important. Mm. Um, I think Bitcoiners. Often it feels like in Bitcoin, like we're all in purgatory, <laughs> <laughs> just kind of waiting for the price to go up and then ask ourselves, like, when am I allowed to spend this thing? <laughs> and I never really wanted to have that be my, uh, my fate. Mm. And I think work is very important. So I think that like Bitcoiners, particularly those that have been here for a little while should be working, deploying capital, mm. um, investing if they have the means, mm. um, but at least like building you know, building a world that we don't prefer. I think it's, I think it's going to look really bad if what happens is we have a bunch of ideologues get to the get to the heaven that mm. we all think is is a coming, mm. and and in that heaven, everyone's uh, everyone's favorite activity is to sit around and wait for other people to do shit. <laughs> <laughs> like it just seems. Like, you know, well, that that's describing like an altcoin or something like I think it's describing most <laughs> Bitcoiners. Like, I think that like there's a lot of Bitcoiners who are working real hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the like core devs and devs mm-hmm. generally do good work. There's just a lot of Bitcoiners who literally are just sitting there waiting to get rich mm. and live in vans. Don't do anything. <laughs> they they like they're, they're just trying to like I, I don't I don't find like there's a lot of useless people who are here because I mean, and they'll probably be made very wealthy by it, Mm -hmm. which, you know, more power to them, but like, they're not useful now. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, my dad would say, you have to tithe before you're rich, Mm -hmm. because if you don't tithe before you're rich, you you won't tithe when you're rich. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, I found that he's right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Take it, you don't tithe then. (laughs) Um, So, uh, no, the the, the thing is, I think if you're not working, Mm -hmm. if you're not contributing, when you, have very little like the idea that these people are going to change their behavior as bitcoin goes up in price Mm. is to me just very unlikely i think that Mm -hmm. they're gonna be lazy then they're lazy now and uh and the result is going to be that they you know have nothing to show for what they've done they're gonna think of themselves as important they're gonna make the podcast rounds or whatever they do and they're not gonna have done anything and it's (laughs) gonna be kind of a sad life and they've had the opportunity to to build something um, I think Bitcoin is a great gift mm. to people who discover it early enough on. And uh, and I think it it's a great gift to the world, mm. but that's like some time off, mm. I think, before we like see that. Mm. So in the meantime, be, become important, mm. do important things, develop important uh, projects and, you know, change industries, become in charge, you know, like that that's that's to me like been kind of the what what I think is important to do is like build build company or you know mm-hmm. invest and stuff like that. So that's kind of I've I've been doing that a lot mm. um apart from just like you know personal like running of a company and mm. stuff like that. Um it, it really hasn't changed that much for me. BU is just the thing you'd sit in front of a, a microphone or record. I still have those same conversations with people, you know. <laughs> um laugh a lot and talk mm. just that like they're not being put out online. Mm. Well, that's uh, that's interesting that you view work that way, that it, it as something that you should keep on doing because otherwise, like it's kind of a waste. Uh, your life is a waste, or something. Like well, that. I think it's I think it's more that like I think it's a uh, it's like it's not like riding a bike. I think mm-hmm. um, I think that you need to keep yourself sharp, mm-hmm. and I, I just I, I think that it's difficult. It's difficult to be sharp if you're not sort of in the world doing mm-hmm. things and uh, and experiencing like you know other people and customers and having to deal with like mm-hmm. you know frustrated individuals and whatnot um, and and creating creating efficiencies and in industries and stuff like that. I just like particularly with men, mm-hmm. I think that it's very important to just be industrious. Mm-hmm. I, I do find that to be like a very important. I think it's an important quality. Mm. And, uh, and I wish, I wish, I'm glad that there are a lot of industrious Bitcoiners. Um, I'm really glad of that. Like there's a whole bunch of industries that have cropped up in Bitcoin that I think are highly useful. 
Uh, but I think there's just like a lot of Bitcoiners who are give are being given the opportunity to be industrious in a way that they never would have been able to afford. Mm. And they they can they could take that opportunity and they could become, you know, wildly wealthy and they could become important in industry and whatnot, and they could become industrious, but they just kind of sit around and do nothing. Mm. So, you know, I, I think it's important, but that's that's why I do it. Mm. Well, I, so in a sense, is is the Bitcoin then a curse because they are prevented from sort of contributing to the world? In a yeah, for, for a lot of people, it is. Mm. I mean, I think that I think that again is that is like we talked about the despondency earlier. That mm. I think is the source of like I think mm. a lot. I mean, you see, you have to have seen this, right? Not because, as much in Austin. I feel like it would be in Miami, though. And these Bitcoiners who like do nothing. Mm. Um, it it is. It is clear that Bitcoin doesn't change, uh, doesn't change who people are. Mm. It's not like it's not redemptive, mm. right? If a person is a murderer before <laughs> they get into Bitcoin, they're they're probably a murderer after they they get into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So like, it's not like it, it's not a redemptive like uh, piece of. It's not a redemptive tool. It doesn't replace the need for like that sort of redemption that like mm -hmm. you know that, that the church, for example, would mm -hmm. like. Um, offer or mm -hmm. but like but like so, so bitcoin is not that but a lot of people mistake it for that they think it's mm -hmm. like bitcoin is itself redemption but it's not mm -hmm. and if you don't if, if you view it as redemption then yes it, it absolutely can be a curse mm -hmm. because it causes you to like have this sort of poisonous perspective on what it means to you and how it can change your life mm -hmm. and it like it won't change you for the better it's just it it will make you more of what you are because you can afford to do it more. So if you're a lazy ass in a van, you'll buy a bigger van. And, <laughs> and have a lazier ass. And have a lazy a bigger, lazier ass. If you're if you're if you on the other hand are like industrious, mm. um, you're likely to start putting your capital towards like making more capital and you know, mm. stuff like that. So I don't know. I, I find it I find it I find it to be a very possibly a giant curse mm. for a lot of people. And I mean, you know, they'll, like I said, they'll be, they may be wealthy, mm. but they're not going to be, uh, contributing. Mm. And I don't you know for some reason, maybe I think that I've gotten a lot of pushback cause like people say that like, it doesn't matter and mm -hmm. it's not for me to judge and, mm -hmm. and it really isn't. Mm. But at the same time, I, I, I do think that as humans, we are better off when we are in like a state of contribute contribution. Mm -hmm. but, well, you know. when you have a purpose or meaning into your life. And yeah, I think that, that's the truth. I mean, like, I don't know if you ever read Viktor Frankl. Uh -huh. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Man's Search for Meaning. That was yeah, the most yeah. important book I ever read. And mm -hmm. that one literally is like, sad, you know, like strive for satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And uh, not happiness, but satisfaction. You find satisfaction in like your day-to-day -day activities. And mm -hmm. that is what your meaning is. So like, I think of that like pretty regularly. I, you know, whether it's a hobby or a job, like it's, it's really important to like do things. Mm -hmm. You know, give yourself tasks don't care what they are you know is as small as, as small as they you know big or small it doesn't really matter just mm. that you know having something to accomplish day to day is like very important and i think i think bitcoin should be very careful of like not not uh working toward accomplishing things daily mm. um, but you know I, that, that might be true of everybody just mm. that in bitcoin it's amplified because the money mm. that's entered the space is so huge mm. so huge <laughs> Donald Trump would say, "Yeah, it 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 is huge, and and that is uh, well. It's interesting that you you put all of these characteristics on Bitcoiners, because at least for me, the uh, like despondency and lack of purpose and meaning is way more obvious in all coiners when you know they made it. You know, like they they've done the pump and you know they follow Dan Larimer or whatever and make a ton of money and." they're the ones that really like have nothing because they 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 now have all this money they what, what are they going to do with well, it well i think that's objectively true mm -hmm. again in the long run but i haven't heard them express their despondency mm. right um like it's it seems like a lot of them set out to accomplish this thing of like getting well a good example mm. uh richard hart mm. with hacks <laughs> right like richard hart set out to get rich uh develop tax and executed on it and a lot of people gave him a lot of money, mm -hmm. and now I think he's a billionaire. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's despondent, despite mm -hmm. of like I think he knows very well what he's done. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and his people, they love him because he gives them like Tony Robbins like speeches every day. <laughs> and I think they know uh, that they're being taken for a ride. Mm -hmm. But yet, like, I don't see any despondency there. I see mm -hmm. that, I see it in Bitcoin. And I, I, like, there's a number of places I've seen it. There's like prominent Bitcoiners have seen it. And it is, it's just, it's just weird. I, I hope, I hope it doesn't persist or grow. But like, I have seen it in, in quite a number of places. Mm -hmm. But maybe you're right. I mean, I just don't see it in altcoiners. Well, I, I, I've I've seen some hints. I, I don't interact with altcoiners too much, but yeah, I, I've seen hints of We're not equally yoked. <laughs> yeah. Well, We're Christians here. That's what... <laughs> <laughs> I, I Jimmy, appreciate all of Jimmy the Song, religious references Jimmy here. Jimmy Song Christian Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Next, we're going to play some news, news radio. <laughs> DC Talk. Oh, boy. That's a, that's a band that hasn't been around in like 25 years. I don't dude. know who they're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Well, <laughs> I can't believe you know about DC Talk. Yeah, of right. course. All right. So I, it, it is interesting, though, because uh, what, what you're saying suggests to me that in a sense, like Bitcoiners almost have a conscience. So they, they do get despondent because they have a conscience, whereas... Yeah. Altcoiners almost don't. That that seems to be a perspective. Well, the altcoin is the removal of the country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that there are a lot of. I think there's a lot of people in the space on both sides actually that have consciences. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the question is like, why are you here? And there's a lot of Bitcoiners who came for ideological reasons, and they're seeing their ideology be challenged. I mm -hmm. think that's a big part of it because like if you came here because this is libertarian money, mm -hmm. and you you are you want to. And, and and Bitcoin fixes this all the time. Mm -hmm. Like if you're mentality, like, think about that. Like Bitcoin fixes this. That is actually not just a meme. That is literally like an ideological statement that Bitcoin fixes these things, all things. Well, that's the name of this podcast, by the way. Well, there you go. <laughs> I knew that. I didn't, I didn't actually know that. <laughs> but if, if you believe, if you believe that Bitcoin fixes all things, right, that is an ideological statement. You're going to be very disappointed mm. when like Kim Jong-un starts using Bitcoin to fund like nuclear warheads or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, or, or like when Bitcoin, um, doesn't, you know, like evil people generally like Putin acquires Bitcoin by selling like oil mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, or, or wars are fought maybe more peacefully. I don't know mm -hmm. over Bitcoin mining stuff or whatever, mm -hmm. but like Bitcoin doesn't fix all things. So if, if in fact, like that's your ideology, you will grow more and more despondent as you see the world move towards like normalcy. Mm -hmm. There are still evil people in the world. Mm -hmm. There are still people that will use Bitcoin for evil. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and maybe it defunds wars. I don't know, mm -hmm. but maybe it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe it makes like Venezuela incredibly wealthy and they march into Mexico and make Mexico part of Venezuela. I don't know. Like, <laughs> like, like I don't know what's going to happen, but like it doesn't, it's not necessarily true that Bitcoin fixes everything, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's not the only ideology that people have come with, mm -hmm. but like there's various ideologies that get knocked down by Bitcoin. And I think what happens is if you, if you came here thinking one thing mm. was true, um, and you find out that maybe it, it is being challenged by the fact that like maybe Bitcoin is not at the price you want or whatever, like it becomes, it becomes really like difficult, I think, to maintain faith. You have to pick between the ideology and sort of the, op the object that you viewed as the solution, the thing that would bring about the heaven that your <laughs> ideology claims will come if what you believe is true. We're getting eschatological here. It, yeah, it, definitely. <laughs> the, the heaven that we wish were true. <laughs> yeah, um, that Bitcoin is eschatology, though. That is, <laughs> we do have eschatology. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah uh, so th that that's a that's a very insightful comment about like how Bitcoiners like do have an ideology that they come in with. So when it fails to show up, I guess, on their time frame, then they end up kind of despondent and disappointed. That's I've essentially seen it, I've it, seen it yeah. enough to think that that probably mm. is the case. Mm. Um, and that, you know, that's interesting to me. I, like, I, all th most things in Bitcoin are, like, I, I tend to be very, I, I tend to be much more of, like, one of these guys who looks at things like, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Everything's interesting. I don't really have <laughs> opinions on it so much as, like, uh, the, the work thing I definitely have an opinion mm -hmm. on. But, like, most things in, in Bitcoin I don't have an opinion on. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, Bitcoin is, it seems very obvious to me that it's important. Mm -hmm. Um 
it's very obvious why it's important. Mm. And in addition, I see these people who were also of that opinion who like get despondent and who have like these modifying perspectives who, you know, and I, I just find that very interesting. Like mm. it, it seems more than one person. Mm. And, um, and that, I guess it's a little, it's not worrying from the perspective, like what is going to happen with Bitcoin, but it, it's worrying from the perspective that like this happens to people. And mm. like, I, I, I find that very curious and interesting. Yeah, I, I, I do remember in 2017, like uh, like with all the SegWit stuff going on, 2016 especially, because there was just so much opposition. Um, People that spun out. Yeah, well, there, there were a bunch of core devs that were like pretty Burned much out, depressed. Yeah. You know, yeah. they, they were oh, like... Oh, I remember like, that. That's yeah, true. Yeah, that, that was like a big deal. But then, you know, things happened and, you know, like basically Bitcoin won over sort of the forces of corporate court yeah or something. you know it's right. it's interesting like a lot of these programmers aren't ready for what they've decided to undertake <laughs> like bitcoin i think I, I said this early on and i stand by it blockchains are war mm. and war is fought in these sporadic battles that you don't see coming mm. and uh, everything is hunky-dory until russia decides to invade ukraine mm. and that's like what happens in bitcoin is like you're going along and then all of a sudden roger veer is like I was going to call him Richard Veer. Yeah. I think I should, uh, <laughs> Richard Hart, Richard, Roger Veer. Richard Veer. <laughs> uh, Roger Veer announces that he's going to announce, like, release, uh, you know, BC, Bitcoin Cash. And all of a sudden, like, you have this ideological war between sides and, like... It you, wasn't him that released it, but, you know, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's the face of it. Uh-huh. Uh, so, you know, you have this, like, weird war. You're, you're fighting. Both sides, like, think they're going to win. Mm. Um... And I kind of sit those out because like I, I feel like I know who's gonna win. It doesn't really like it doesn't <laughs> like one has momentum. The other mm. is like a bunch of like ingrates trying to, <laughs> to make changes. But like, but like you know, it, it really is it really is a battle, and it can get ugly and weird. Mm. And you know, I thought I thought the U uh, USAF mm. United States Air Force, which the what is that? UASF mm -hmm. United Air States Force. <laughs> United Air States Force. Um, UASF. User activated software. Yes. <laughs> the UASF, I think, was one of the more interesting moments in Bitcoin history. Mm. And I think that, like, giving the users the knowledge that they could do that mm. is was important because mm. it, it rejiggered where where it looked like the center of power was mm -hmm. and this this in the middle of like accusations about how core the core mm -hmm. devs had all the power mm -hmm. i thought it was really interesting because i think it was an important moment for that reason oh it, huge like, importance it ripped yeah. it ripped this like veil of stupidity off of most of the arguments about power in bitcoin the mi minor centralization is the thing we got to worry about it's mm -hmm. all minor central blah, blah, blah. like no maybe not and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden like this thing happens and it's like oh wait node holders have like a very important place mm -hmm. in the ecosystem holy shit mm. what about miners like well we don't give a shit about them we, <laughs> we, we, we are the nodes we pick them uh -huh. so that's that's what's going on there mm. and uh and the core devs like we pick them too in mm -hmm. a sense like mm -hmm. we get to pick what we implement and what we don't mm. so like the idea that the node operators can literally like vote mm. was really interesting mm. really interesting and it's a weird both like it's a security feature and flaw and and is it's just incredibly interesting and, and that was an important moment and i think mm -hmm. that like these wars are going to reveal those you know in the way that when we went to the moon we developed those like shiny blankets that we give to immigrants mm -hmm. they would have to use wool blankets if it weren't for us going to the moon <laughs> right so that innovation has made uh refugee status like much more warm at night. so that was <laughs> and important. marathon runners and yeah. marathon runners yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so like that, that's an important, and in, in the same way that's, I, I feel like these attacks on Bitcoin, uh, we have like innovations like UASF, mm. Air, Air States Force, yes. Like <laughs> <laughs> UASF. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, that was kind of like, a an interesting moment and it does sort of like seem to show something very different about Bitcoin versus everything else. Yeah. Um, and that, that, well, hey. We've been talking about this for what, like 
30 minutes. I thought we were going to wrap up like <laughs> way longer. Oh, really? Ago. But, <laughs> but hey, we, we, yeah, yeah, we could, we, <laughs> I, we, we could I don't definitely. think there's ever been a, a podcast with me on it less than seven or eight hours long. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I could kind of believe that. We do, no. we do long, and we always did long, like BU is always long. We did like two, three hours. We started out sh short because uh -huh. it was like part of a, a podcast called the Counterparty Chit Chat. And so mm -hmm. it was like at the very end, it was like mm -hmm. a five minute segment. Uh -huh. And, uh, and, uh, what happened is we would do the segment uh -huh. and people would delete the rest of the episode, just skip to the end to listen to it. And so like we became an ever increasing part of that show, <laughs> became, like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then eventually it was like, to welcome to the crowd party chit chat. I'm going to hand the rest of the show off to Chris <laughs> and, and John Seth. And, uh, and then like we were the whole show and then what was happening is on the uh, Let's Talk Bitcoin Network, Adam Levine kept cutting out all of our swear words. Uh -huh. So then people wanted to hear the swearing. <laughs> so we were like, okay, well, we'll put the whole episode up on SoundCloud and we'll just call it Bitcoin Uncensored. Mm. And uh, and then people would go there and listen to it instead of the Let's, Let's Talk, Talk Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Wow. And that's kind of how that happened. But like uh. they just became longer and longer because they went until <laughs> like we were just done talking. Well, it's amazing <laughs> like what, what people will have a tolerance for as long as they're getting entertained. They'll, they'll listen to podcasts that well, are like six hours. I listen to the old BUs and uh -huh. like I can't stop laughing. Like they're very <laughs> funny. I... I gotta say, like that guy, John Seth, is <laughs> very clever. Like, really? <laughs> I just, like there's some of the jokes. So we'll go, like, do you remember? Is, when he, he, is he skinnier? Maybe he's, also. He, he uh, 2014. John Seth was <laughs> still fat. Okay. Um, so, so it's, it's funny. People come to me like, you, you, you know, back, back. I was listening to you, and, mm -hmm. and there was this joke you made. You said this, and I was like, oh. That's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I was very funny. That yeah. was very, that's very funny. I wish I'd written that one down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, they, it was kind of like a cultural moment. So it's it's kind of interesting that you don't really do that anymore. Like, what whatever happened with you and Chris anyway? Um. Well, Chris Chris took the show. He made accusations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that were, you know, in my mind, false. They, mm -hmm. they, they objectively are, but like, mm -hmm. it's still a fun moment to end the show on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never really, I never really defended it because it mm -hmm. was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually offered the show to Chris many months earlier mm -hmm. because I could tell that he kind of wanted to take it on mm -hmm. his own. So he mm -hmm. decided to do what he did. Mm -hmm. I let him do it. You know, mm -hmm. he didn't really um, fight it. I thought it was a good time for the show to end. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, because like Bitcoin was changing, mm -hmm. and uh, we, it, it. It was going to become at some point a bit redundant. Mm. Like we were doing this thing where we're like every week we'd have a new shit coin on, we'd call <laughs> them a scam, we'd make jokes. And like to me, what made the show really interesting and unique was the conversations between me and Chris. Mm. Like that was the thing that people liked. And the interviews were superfluous. Mm. Like people liked the banter. That was really what it was. And that was what made the show unique and mm -hmm. interesting. Um, just sort of the two of us exchanging and it was changing and like it just to me it, it couldn't it couldn't change like mm. the show couldn't take money it couldn't mm. make money it, it really had a limited life in that sense it had to be like it had it had to be independent and without coercion from like an audience mm -hmm. or an advertiser or anything mm. it was the only way it would it would be interesting mm. and honestly like in retrospect it was the right time like we've entered this like woke phase politically <laughs> and like, could you like be you couldn't have existed in a woke world for well, I a mean, lot who's going to cancel you though. Like you didn't have any advertisers. Like you said, that was kind of the, well, it's, it's not about, it's not about who would have canceled us. Uh -huh. it, just, it just would not like, like people would have felt bad about themselves <laughs> like it's just like that's the thing like I, I i see this a lot there's a lot of people changing and mm -hmm. they're like oh like you know maybe some of the woke stuff is acceptable and i just find that hilarious because mm -hmm. none of it is acceptable like, <laughs> um it just it had its moment and it was good and it preempted the woke stuff like mm -hmm. if you listen to it it really is like making fun of the coming woke ideology mm -hmm. like there's a lot of stuff in it that we make fun of like i you know discuss my sexual orientation on the show as a <laughs> trans cis black african-american white woman um and that was like you know th that kind of thing like that was mm -hmm. very much preempted like any of the discussions about trans issues and whatnot mm -hmm. and it was just you know it just it was a different show different time and it was clear that it was a kind of like i think i think from the perspective of 
from my perspective, it was losing steam because um, for various reasons internally mm. that like were personal and relational. Like toward the end, uh, I I would get the sense like Chris wouldn't laugh at the jokes anymore. Mm. It was, you know, it was kind of like he clearly didn't want to do it with me anymore, mm. which was fine. Um, but that was that was what I, I I could tell personally, and it was it was becoming a bit of a burden, mm. and I think it was just good. It was a good time to end it mm. before before it got bad. <laughs> before it got bad. It kind of got bad uh, towards the end there. Anyway, it got but, bad. I mean, oh, yeah, like, yeah, in the sense that like you guys, you know, had a very public breakup and everything else. So, well, that wasn't on me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I enough. didn't say a word. I didn't say a word for a very long time about mm -hmm. it. And uh, you know, like it was, it was public, but I didn't make it public. And mm -hmm. it was, um, it was, you know, amicable in the sense that I'm okay. I was okay with it. Mm. I wish it had been in a way that like allowed us to be friends, mm. but you know, it, it, for me, the trust was sort of destroyed. Mm. Well, have you thought about doing more podcasts or are you like done with that? No, I thought about it. I, I, I like making kind of, I did John Seth's world for a while. That was fun. Yeah, kind uh -huh. of a continuation. Um, COVID kind of ended that. Mm. And, um, but I've, I've thought about getting back on the horse. The problem is like, I think that like a co-host is important for me mm. and I, uh, I don't want to do something that will always like, like Bitcoin Uncensored is a singular work of art in mm. my opinion, mm. like what, whatever anyone wants to call it. I call it a work of art. Mm -hmm. I think it's my Mona Lisa. Um, <laughs> it's got a big butt for a face, but it's my Mona Lisa. And I don't want to do so. If I did another podcast, I wouldn't want it to be something that was comparable. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to think like, "Oh, he's just like remaking Bu." Mm -hmm. You know, I would want it to be something different. Uh, you know, I've thought I've thought about ideas, but like if I did something, it would have mm -hmm. to be that like very very different. So uh, it, it's almost like you have an artistic integrity about this whole thing. Like you you want to make sure that you're not copying yourself and doing something. Well, I want to make sure that yeah. it's not. It's not derivative. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, if, if I were to do another podcast, I wouldn't think of it as art. I think I would have mm -hmm. think I would think of it as like a business, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is a very different mentality to approach it with. Like, mm -hmm. you can't do Alpha Bay ads mm -hmm. when you're thinking <laughs> <laughs> of it as a business because then you actually have to take the money. Uh -huh. So, like, when you're when you're making parody, mm -hmm. uh, which is art, uh, mm -hmm. then you can do Alpha Bay ads. Mm -hmm. But I think parody and financing are unreconcilable really yeah because hmm. I'm, I'm sure the onion gets a bunch of ad money and so it's bad Babylon parody. b or whatever makes makes them both bad parody <laughs> like I, you you can have parody mm -hmm. but like you can't have parody as art mm. um because like there's nothing you can't say anything important mm. if you have an a perspective that the audience requires you to have mm. so like the Babylon b is actually a really good example because like they have to remain conservative. Mm. Like they have to like appeal to a specific side of the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that they're funny, mm -hmm. but like, it's not, it's not, they're not able to like do what I would say is like very important sort of commentary mm. without violating that like audience expectation. Whereas like BU, we had no, like <laughs> we didn't give a shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> There was no, there was no, I, like, if, if the audience did like it, I didn't care. Like, neither did Chris. It was just like, who gives a shit? Like, yeah, yeah well, that, that, that does give you some measure of freedom for yeah. sure. Yeah. And the, I mean, the perspective, like, it's, it, you know, so if I did it, I would think of it as like a business mm -hmm. and it would be a very different type of experience. Mm. Um, it would just be, it'd probably be more journalistic or something like that, but like nothing like what BU would, mm. would have been. And uh, it's, frankly, it's necessary. It just has to kind of remain on its own canvas. And then whatever comes next, if I decide to like do another podcast, it really needs to be very, very different. Mm. And I need to like, before I do that, I think though, I have other goals. I'd, I'd kind of like to lose some weight first. <laughs> <laughs> Told you about fasting earlier. Yeah, yeah, that was good. I'll yeah, try it. Yeah. No, I, I really would like, I, I think I think for me, um, 
many years in Bitcoin, many years as an entrepreneur, all that stuff. I think I think it is an important thing to like kind of focus on some of my own health and make sure that like I'm around for a while, at least I hope. Mm. You know? Yeah, I hope so. Well, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, I mean, it's it's uh, wow. I can't. It, the time just kind of flew by, and I knew you could talk, but man, you <laughs> you, you 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 talk. How long has it been? Like Where are we at six? It, I, I don't know, not quite. I, oh, the block oh, I clock it tells off. you something else. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it, you know, it's been like an hour forty minutes. Wow, like that so that that was like a hundred minutes of content, which is mostly great. just me just going. <laughs> Good. That'll maybe stop. maybe we'll we'll we'll, we'll do another embarrassing episode. stuff i said because like uh, there's got to be stuff in there you know it's mm. really embarrassing oh i mean we, like I, you have no there shame so i'm not sure you there I was can the really impression of your dad that was yeah. pretty embarrassing for you well that that was actually pretty hilarious so um we, <laughs> we'll see what my dad thinks of it i'll, I'll send it to him it's like, like, i'm not chinese <laughs> My dad also isn't a yeller, dude. Like that's just not how he does things. <laughs> I've been doing. A, I've I've been working on my Korean. Okay, lately, Korean. So Wait, have, let's hear I the Korean impression. The, I can say all of the states in a Korean in Korean. Oh uh, yeah, Alabama, uh -huh. Alaska. Uh huh. <laughs> that's pretty good. Dad. Arizona, uh huh. Arkansas, uh -huh. California. Wait, did you memorize everything in alphabetical order? Is that what you did with uh states or something? Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> Cali. California, uh -huh. Colorado. <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. You need more aspiration in your Col accent. Yeah. Colorado. Uh, that sounds like more Mexican than like Korean. Colo actually. Yeah. Colo Colorado. That's what I said. <laughs> no, there, there's Colorado. not enough H's. There's not enough H's. Colorado. Just it, pretend that there's an H before and after every vowel, and you'll you'll get the Korean. Connecticut. <laughs> that sounded more Japanese, but you know what? <laughs> Yeah, you, you, I got to teach you about being Asian, dude. All right. <laughs> we'll do that sometime. Anyway, uh, I, I, I think that's a good, good place to end it with Florida. a lot of, lot, lot of racism. Uh, but you know, what, where can people find you? Where can people, uh, well, I, so I was I kicked off Twitter for anti-Semitism, okay. but I got back on, okay. uh, which <laughs> maybe is short lived. So uh -huh. I, I am at the, uh, the handle at very small claims. Very small claims. Yeah, I tried to do very small claims court, which I thought was. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I had this idea of like uh, taking someone to court for like like your Gatorade being drank off the table. Okay, you know? very small claims. Um, like okay. very small claims. Uh -huh. uh, so very at very small claims. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll see how long I'm on Twitter for. But other than that, it's it's not. I'm not like. You don't have a website or anything. No, no. Oh. I've I've been making the rounds. You uh, you know, hit me up when you're at a conference. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm around. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not inaccessible. I've been doing Clubhouse a lot, mm -hmm. so you get on Clubhouse. You know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not hard to find mm. in Bitcoin. Mm. Um, but yeah, did you, did you know about? I got nicks from Twitter. I didn't realize that. Yeah, for anti-Semitism. Okay. I told it. So are all all our like old DM messages are gone now? I guess. I. I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. that's good for you. I mean. <laughs> 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 like, I, I, I told a joke on Twitter is, what do you call Israeli winemakers? What? Grape juice. <laughs> that really? That's, yeah, the yeah. that's the one that yeah, got that's the one that got me. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So I had to change. You know what I, you know what I say now? When Jews people, juice pun. That's, that's the one that, that, was, that yeah. got Do you, you know what I do now when people tell me that they're a Jew? What's that? I say Gesundheit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Well, um, <laughs> I I would be surprised if that one got you kicked off of Twitter. That mm. that's that's actually kind of like I think more, that one now is going to get you kicked off. Whatever uh, this, on a uh, or something, you know. Yeah. Um, well, it's a homonym. Yeah. So uh, Twitter didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I I mean I guess it is what it is. So mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, thanks, John Seth, for coming on. Thanks for um, having me. And Jimmy. yeah, it, it was a lot of fun, and we'll have to do it again. Absolutely. All right.